to talk about the 828s, I have to start a long way back. It's a bit like the old showbiz joke about uh, it takes 50 years to become an overnight star, because mixes are a bit like that. It wasn't my idea, the 828. It, um, we'd started the Alice Company in 1969, and uh, we, were, we were doing very nicely, building huge, great mixes for, for film companies and for, and for theatres in London. Now, I have a, a huge regard for Barry Lambden. Barry was uh, the guy who ran a little company in Eton, just across the river from Windsor, where the Alice organisation was. And uh, he used to import Revox tape machines. That's not the Revox A77 that we know, we know nowadays. It's the, in those days, it was the, um, the Revox G36 which is a, a big chunky machine that if you tried to pick it up it was a bit like picking up a washing machine. Barry had the idea that um, it would be a really nice idea to, to have a mixer to go along with the, the tape recorder as a, a, a portable mixer, a little mixer. And he came to us with the idea that uh, we might like to design one for him. We spent some time on ideas and, and design and came up with some products the first attempt was the ITAM 10-4. It was a nice design, but uh, not, not greatly appreciated. And then we went on to make a six-channel version, and I have to admit they were not initially a success. We produced and sold a few AD62 mixers, as they were called, but the response was not ecstatic. And then at a design meeting, Eric, our production director, he suggested that we got it all wrong. Our equipment was just too light. Let's make them out of 1.2 millimetre steel, he suggested, and so, uh, so that people will know that they bought something. Well, we upped the number of channels from 6 to 8 because the original AD62 was a 6-channel mixer, and, um, and we called it the 828. Now, by that time, we were an efficient and responsible company, I think. I'd like to think we were. Um, but we were more used to making big mixes for theatres and film studios. So we designed the details of the new 828 really carefully. So Eric was absolutely right. Everyone was super impressed. In fact, it weighed in at 10 kilograms exactly. So, what was the thinking behind the mixer? Well, we decided that what was needed was a general purpose mixer that was easy to use both in a studio and out on location. So, um, just to go over it in a, in a little bit more detail, the eight microphone inputs had to be of really good quality because this was meant to be, a, I mean, this was a professional mixer. So they should be transformer inputs, because that was the that was the way in those days. Interestingly, there was no phantom power on the Mark One, the uh, A twenty eight Mark One. The late seventies that was a time when capacitor mics were very expensive, and the Sure SM fifty eight was good enough for most things. Possibly the the OB people, the outside broadcast lot. They used T-Power mics with separate battery packs. Well, I contacted Dr. Sauter at Sauter Transformers, and we had a special designed and, and made for us. The EQ, the equaliser, was intended to be just that, in the same way that equalisers were when they were first developed in the 1930s. They, I mean, they were de developed originally because there was a problem in the film studios because they couldn't get the sound the same when they moved the microphones because they were all the time trying to hide the microphones behind plant pots and things and uh, and the sound was never the same so they had to use equalizers to to make them all equal well we chose to use a simple Baxendall shelving HF and LF EQ and that proved to be absolutely right and the the mid control that is that it's got on it gave the opportunity to, to tweak the sound a little bit to get it just right some years later 
Peter Baxendall telephoned me to tell me how he liked the EQ on the H28, and um, I had the, <laughs> the pleasure of telling him that, uh, to th of thanking him, to say that actually uh, it should be good because you designed it. <laughs> to keep it really simple, we included just a pre-fader auxiliary output for studio or location foldback and a post-fader echo send or effect send for use in the studio with effects. And although it was all the rage to have 100mm long faders on mixes, we decided to reduce it to 60mm to economise on space. Now, I'd been experimenting with all sorts of limiters and compressors back then. It was an obsession of mine. Now, bear in mind that this predates the Joe Meek compressor by 20 years. I felt that we needed some dynamic control on the groups on the H28, so I tried to design a, a, a viable optical compressor, but it was not a, a, not a technical success. I felt that the best I could come up with at the time was just not reliable enough. So I opted to go for a unique discrete limiter design that fitted well with the, with the 8-channel format. That proved, in fact, to be a good decision. And the limiter proved to be an absolute winner as an overload protection on location, film and outside broadcast sets. It survives today as the limiter in the 500 series mic amps that I've designed. We fitted SIFAM VU meters on the 828 with the option of our own version of the BBC Peak Program meter for the Beeb and for engineers, of course, who prefer to work with PPMs. The terminations on the 828 were mainly standard jack rather than anything less reliable like the, the DIN connector which keep falling out. Many clients demanded additional features like back of fader switching for monitor muting or machine starting and of course phantom power. The power supply was a good selling point too. The, the internal supply was mains powered with a, with a special low radiation toroidal mains transformer. But we also provided a pair of sockets on the back panel so the mixer could operate from a camera battery pack, which was really useful for outside broadcasts. This was absolutely ideal for the film people. They used it on programs like The Avengers and The Professionals and The Bill. The later 828 Mark II took advantage of more up-to-date technology. It used integrated circuits and as a result we achieved a slightly lower noise level but this, this introduced a subtle change. People were critical that the sound had changed and well for 90% of the of users the, the new mixer in fact was just as good or they couldn't tell the difference. One or two still preferred the old Mark I. So What's the new version of the 828 going to be like? How does the 828S Mark III differ from the old Mark I? The whole basis is that the new mixer is a reintroduction. It's a way to get the sound and quality of the original, just as it was back in the late 1970s. I shall describe the very minor differences between the, the old original Mark I and the new Mark III in another recording. I'm caught inside the crossfire Trying to keep track of all the lies Tell one at a time You 